It's life, you know. Whenever God opens the windows of heaven to bless you, you can be certain that the devil will open up the, the doors of hell to blast you. And that's kind of what's going on here. After coming down from the mountain, Jesus and the disciples were immediately, immediately approached by a man with a demon-possessed child. Well, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, so I want to give you a, a painting that was uh, painted by one of my favorite artists, by the way. His name is Raphael. Uh, this is the painting that he painted uh, called Transfiguration, and it was painted in 1517. It was Raphael, by the way, it was his last work. He actually died before it was completely uh, finished. He, uh, he died on the day of his 37th birthday. Uh, Raphael died on Good Friday, and interesting enough, he was born on a Good Friday. Only lived for 37 years. And so he, he, he takes the biblical picture, and he kind of, he, whenever he paints this picture, he kind of ignores spatial, um, you know, limitations, and he wants to give the full story of the transfiguration on one canvas. And so when he paints, he paints the picture from what we saw last week, and he also includes the story of what we're looking at this week. So when you look at the picture, you see, you know, Jesus, of course, is the center, you know, and, and floating in the air to convey his divinity and, and kind of like the glory emanating from within him. And on one side is Elijah clutching his prophetic mantle. Moses is on the right holding a tablet of stone. And immediately underneath Jesus, you see the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, kind of cringing in fear and, and shutting their eyes from the brilliant light that's emanating from Christ. Now, the other disciples are on the bottom, on the left. Not surprisingly, all the disciples kind of look like middle-aged Italian men. And Raphael, he actually would paint people that he knew. And, and so you're seeing people that he knew, their faces on, on the disciples. And... Uh, You'll notice in the bottom right a struggling boy with kind of a tortured look on his face and his body is kind of contorted. Uh, you see uh, the, the man that's holding the boy, that's his father. And the woman kneeling in the center, that's the boy's mother, pointing back toward the troubled child. Uh, Raphael did his best to kind of portray the failure of the disciples to respond to the desperate situation to the boy. You know, there's, there's one disciple that's kind of reading from a book, apparently searching for a medical cure. One of the disciples is pointing to the possessed boy. Another one is uh, pointing to the glory of Christ. And it really is hard to see from this picture, but there's a sinister Judas that's kind of in the background, uh, and, 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 and he put him in that picture too. But I really want you to look at the inset in the next frame the picture of the, of the boy, this miserable boy who's being restrained by his father. He has this crazed expression, and, and actually there's foam trickling out of his, uh, his mouth down his chin. His body and his feet are twisted in a painful contortion. But the look on the face of the father really rever reveals desperation and frustration. He's desperate for someone to help his son. But he's showing disappointment and frustration for because of the failure of the disciples. Raphael brilliantly captured the overwhelming contrast be between the glory of the transfiguration and, and, and the troubled world waiting below in the valley. What a contrast between last week and this week. Luke goes on in the story and he says, Behold, a man from the crown cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. This is a desperate dad, if there ever was one. He is a son that is possessed by a demon. I beg you to look at him. Epiblapo is the Greek word. And it mean, it, it, and it's, it's not a casual kind of a glance. It, Pay special intense uh, 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 concentration on my boy. Could you please, I beg you, you hear the intensity in his voice. Every parent could certainly relate to the cry of this man. 
our hearts go out to children, especially when they have a kind of some kind of debilitating illness or a problem that we can't resolve. But the boy's father really understands the situation for what it is. This is not a medical problem. This is not a medical situation. This is a spiritual problem. Notice that when the father talks to Jesus about the boy, he says a spirit seizes him. The man has a personal day-to-day -day experience with his son, and he knows that the problem that, the, that his son is struggling with is not just a biological issue. There's much more going on here. When you read the story in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 21 says that Jesus asked his father how long the boy had suffered from the problem and, 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 and dad replies from childhood probably the boy was a, a, maybe a young teenager at this point and uh, you know he's at, he's at the point where you know boys would be learning a trade and beginning to look toward the responsibilities of manhood but this boy's life was being ruined by Satan himself Mark informs us that the boy was sometimes cast into a fire to burn him, sometimes in water to drown him. This demon was trying to destroy the boy physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, in every way possible. Let, him, let me remind you, by the way, that that's the story of this world that we live in. Every problem, every heartache, every area of brokenness, Every struggle that we see going on in our world is somehow, one way or another, tethered back to Satan. How many people do we know whose lives have been ruined by a spirit? I mean, take a look at the news when you go home tonight. You'll hear more stories of riots and looting and fires and shootings, the results of prejudice and racism and racial discrimination and the rage that it has created in our land. It is all in one way or another demonic in its origin. A spirit has seized our nation. Don't think for a moment that the problems that we are facing in our country or in our world are only political in nature. Don't think for a moment that the stories that you see on your channels are a result of, you know, some social ills or abnormal cultural norms. You see, if you misdiagnose the root of the cause of a disease, you will always come up with the wrong treatment plan. Our nation has re-engaged in a civil war, and no one is seemingly paying attention to the one who has ignited it all. Satan stands on the sidelines laughing with delight as we fight against one another. The peace and the tranquility of our land has been disrupted and spoiled by the same one who was spoiling this young man's life. The accuser of the brethren has ruined thousands of countless lives through the years. There's not a person here or listening who does not know of someone who was represented in that heartbreaking scene that was on the screen a moment ago. In one way or another, their lives have been ruined, whether it be by drugs or alcohol or anger or just plain old-fashioned self-centeredness and pride. They are enslaved and suffering a lifetime of pain and anguish because the Spirit has seized them. When will we come to an understanding that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places? This is a verse that needs far more than a glancing blow that we're going to give it this morning. But the truth of that verse needs to be heard. You are not battling people. There is a spiritual opposition that has set itself against you. And we need to recognize that. There is a spiritual reality that has set itself against us. If you miss this foundational truth in the battles that you are facing, you will respond to the battles in a way that not only misses bringing you relief, but it will wear you out as you try to solve your problems over and over and over again the wrong way. 
If you're trying to solve a spiritual problem with an earthly response, you can expend every ounce of energy that you have, and you will not move one inch forward. 